and standard PCs rather. Um, so that's not much compared to the trillions and trillions of years you'd, you'd need to break RSA or AES, but still out of the reach of most people, which is why we need another approach towards breaking this. And um, the key here are time memory trade-offs, and the idea leading up to time memory trade-offs is a code book. A code book works the following way. You compute a data set where you know that some, some data item will be encrypted every time you see a conversation. So you take this data item and encrypt it under every possible key and store this in a table along with the key you use to encrypt it. You sort that by the encrypted data package. Now next time you see a data package, this encrypted data package on the air, you just use this lookup table to find the key that encrypted it. Easy enough? Again, that works for, for small key ciphers, and G A51 is just a little bit above where this becomes impractical, since just writing out this table is somewhere in excess of 100 petabyte. So Google may be able to do it, but we are not. Um, so we need, we need to do two things to make this practical. First, we need to be able to compute this data set much faster than 100,000 years. And then we need to be able to store it in some compressed form in a much more practical than 100 petabyte form. Right? And that's the two, two dimensions of improvement that, that I want to discuss with you now to show you the, the process leading up to then actually decrypting a GSM phone call. Let's focus on, on the, the, the speed of, of generation first. Um, we did improve, and this is now about a year of, of engineering. We did improve this, this cracker over and over and over again, the table generation of it in particular, um, through massive parallelization um, within single machines. G GPUs is the, the key word here. Through changing the algorithm to be parallelizable much better, and to finally find a shortcut in A51, and then after all exploiting a statistical property of A51 um, to make this a lot cheaper to compute. As our target, um, we are using GPU chips on graphics cards as our optimization target. Um, they're almost as efficient as FPGAs, but much easier to program and much more available. So GPUs give us vast parallelization potential. You can stick up to six GPUs into a single PC, three PCI Express cards with two GPUs each. On each of these GPU, there's up to 60 computing cores. So where your Intel processor has two or four maybe, each of these has 60, very small, but still independent computing cores. And to further increase the, the, the level of parallelization here, we, use, uh, we apply a technique called bit slicing, where you are taking chunks of data from several data streams, stuff this into one data word, and have an operation be executed on the entire data word. So it's what back in the day was called um, multiple data single instruction. That uh, same idea in, in cryptography is usually referred to as bit slicing. Taken to the extreme, you just take a single bit of each of your data streams and stuff all of this in one, one data word, uh, which can be up to 256 bits. So really in a single instruction, you're doing something to 256 data streams in parallel on each of your 60 cores in each of the six GPUs in your one computer. So there's really 100,000 computations going on in parallel while we are computing these tables. Almost the same degree of parallelization can be reached for, for the cracking phase. Um, not quite as trivial to implement, though. For the, for the generation, um, this, this was fairly straightforward since the 
um, since the computing streams are independent of one another. Now, that's the, this is the dimension um, in which we optimize for parallelization. Now, I said we did also um, use one statistical property of A51 to further optimize this. Um, and I believe nobody else is exploiting this yet. There's, there are commercial A51 crackers on the market, um, and just from, from the, 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 the price, the power consumption, or resource consumption, um, it, it appears that nobody is using the shortcut I'm about to describe. Um, a little bit of, of background. So most, uh, most, most stream ciphers back in the day were built from linear feedback shift register. Linear feedback shift register is basically a counter mod a number, a sequence they go through all numbers within a range and then wraps around. And again, goes through the same numbers in order and wraps around. So it, it starts at some number, and if you compute the function on, on it, it reaches some other number. You compute a function again, it reaches some other number, and eventually the circle closes after you've gone through all the numbers. That's a property of a linear feedback shift register. So if if F1 was, was built from one, this circle would have a size of 2 to the 64 numbers until it wraps around. Now, F1 isn't built from this. Because early on, people understood that linear feedback shift registers are statistically broken. You can um, use set solvers, you can use linear approximation if there's bad filter function and all these things to break these. So this is disqualified to build the stream cipher on. Um, what people are using instead is what I now call a non-linear feedback shift register. And that's what's, what A51 is built upon. It's an, it is an LFSR that's clocked irregularly, though. And that makes it an, a non-linear feedback shift register. Non-linear, in the simplest definition, means there's several inputs that lead to the same output. For instance, an n function is, is nonlinear. There's three inputs that lead to the same output in an n function, right? So what, whenever you see ands or ors being used or non-regular clocking, that becomes nonlinear. Um, now, what, the, what, what the, the result of several inputs mapping to the same output is that some values in the output range can never be computed, right? Pigeonhole principle. So really, if the input range is the same size as the output range, some values will never survive the first iteration. Some more values will not survive the second iteration. And as you keep computing the same function on this number range, the set of possibilities keeps shrinking. So shown, shown visually, um, we still do have um, a circle, um, but that's, uh, well, in, in this case, in fact, I think it's several circles. However, there's branches of this circle of values that do compute the same output, but that are not part of the circle. They will never be reached again. Does that make sense? So the circle in the middle is much smaller, and it's still a circle in itself. But there's some, some values, the, the other inputs that lead to the same outputs, that are just not part of that circle. Now, in, in GSM, they, they do us a favor. They do compute A51 100 times before using the first outputs of it. So you do the first 100 steps in this scheme before any attackable output is generated, meaning Every, every output that's up to 100 steps away from the circle, but not actually on the circle, will never be used to generate a GSM output. All these extra states around it are irrelevant for breaking A51 in GSM. And the circle inside is only something like 2 to the 61. 
So that's an eight time, eight times um, improvement of both attack time and storage, meaning if you keep your storage constant, you're improving by more than a factor of 30 your attack time, right? And that's a statistical vulnerability of, of A51. Some newer ciphers, they intentionally use a larger state size than the secret key size, acknowledging the fact that in fact their state will collapse onto some smaller number. And in fact, even some ciphers that are used by GSM phones use this, um, but not A51. So we can, we can exploit this, this much easier than we saw it. And in fact, we only added this improvement after our rainbow table release in December. So we computed a, a completely new set of tables um, during the months of, of April on merely four computers um, that's now available on BitTorrent as of today. Now that's how we make sure we can compute it in feasible time, by paralyzing the computation and by computing much less than from the outside appears necessary. So we can compute it on four computers on one month. Now, this slide starts getting into how we can store it smaller. Even two to the 61 values written out is still something, I don't know, 20 petabytes, still not very feasible. So the key here is what I call time memory trade-offs, um, a way to store a code book compressed. Now recall the code book um, was, a, uh, was a set of keys and the outputs it would generate. Um, oops. Um, ordered by that output. We want to be able to store this set much more compressed so it would fit on what we can share over BitTorrent, in this case, two terabytes, or that we can at least share over postal mail, which is how we've been doing it so far. And here's how we would do this. Instead of computing um, just one hop from one key to the output, we're computing several hops in a chain of computations. So each of these k's is an A51 computation. Of, of these chains, we only store the very first and the very last element in the table. So if this table still um, covers all the 2 to the 61 values, the wider the table becomes, the less you have to store since it's shrinking in height. Now that's the one side of the trade-off. You, you gain space and efficiency. Here's the other side of the trade-off. In order to find anything in this table, you may need to compute a large number of A51s. Say on your air interface, um, you're seeing this value. You didn't actually store this value in your table, so looking it up in this table uh, returns nothing. You don't give up, though, but rather compute A51 on it, reaching this value, Again, you look it up in your table, and you find nothing. You keep computing A51 on it until eventually you do have a value that is stored on the t in the table, and that points you to the correct chain, and starting to compute that chain from the beginning leads to the secret key that generated the value you saw. Now, the longer these chains become, meaning the more space efficient you are, the longer you may need to compute A51 on it to find it. So that's the time memory trade-off. Right? Now this straightforward approach does not work for two reasons. First, just statistically speaking, you will never cover all 2 to the 61 values in this table because remember the, the circle where all the values wrap around many of these chains will overlap in parts. And as you, you keep adding chains to an already large data set, chances are you're only creating more redundancy rather than adding more values. So that's the one thing that makes this impractical. The second is, um, is the speed of hard disks. For this to work, the chains need to be something like 
million long.